Use code JACK250 to get $250 off to the BlockWorks Digital Asset Summit. It's in New York in September, and ticket prices are only going up. Link is in the description. I am joined by Saul Mercogliano, maritime historian and professor of history at Campbell University. Saul, great to have you on Forward Guidance. It's great to be here with you. Saul, I'm so glad you're here because you are an expert in shipping, and that uh, shipping really has been at the forefront of macroeconomics, inflation, the global economy. You know, if you turn on the TV, you'll hear a lot about supply chain this, supply chain that. But you know, what actually is the supply chain? You know, a, a huge amount of it is shipping. And the price of ships, the price of carrying things from point A to point B has just skyrocketed higher. Now it's in decline uh, now that you know, economic growth is slowing, slowing worldwide. First of all, do you agree, do, do you agree with my uh, claim, the assertion that shipping uh, has really driven inflation uh, over the past two years? Oh, I think it's been a primary driver. It's not the sole driver by any means, of course, but it has definitely uh, contributed to it. And if you go post COVID, the outbreak of COVID in March of 2020, and then all of a sudden this huge demand spike in goods, the, the growth of e-commerce takes off. And what we're seeing right now was freight rates uh, increase dramatically, in some cases, almost tenfold. Uh, and now what we're seeing is really a plateauing of the freight rates, but still at a pretty high level. And it wasn't even just a shift in from, from services to consumer goods. It was the type of consumer goods changed. And the problem you had was nobody knew when COVID was going to end. And so you had sh goods coming across for an economy that was factored in. You got to remember the minute you push that button on your phone for Amazon, that good has been moving for 180 to 120 days already. So, you know, you had the pre-COVID economy goods coming in, but then everything shifts and now people are ordering new things. You know, they're ordering the, the office furniture, they're officing, you know, stuff for the home, uh, you know, the different type of toilet paper than the commercial toilet paper. You need the residential. But nobody knew when that was going to end. And so what you had was really a, a series of issues that took place. Number one, on ships, there was a lot of excess capacity on shipping out there, on ocean shipping. And so the ocean ships could accommodate that. These container liners had been built to these ever larger numbers. You saw a vast economy of scale being implemented. And so the ships could take a pre-COVID load of goods plus a COVID load of goods on board at the same time. And the issue you had then is when that stuff arrived into U.S. ports, the ports were finite. They were set for a specific level of goods coming in. And what you literally saw was a tsunami wave of cargo hit the U.S. supply chain to a point where you saw the, the, the issues come to bear, you know, not enough truck drivers, not enough warehouse capacity, not enough rail capacity. You know, we could accommodate about a percent or two growth here and there with spikes, but this was across the board. And not only that, it was more than several percent. And, you know, you can build a ship in two years. You can't really rebuild an infrastructure for a port in a community in anything less than 10. And so what we saw was all of a sudden this wave of goods come over and then you got bidding wars going in to get their goods here. Well, I still need my goods coming in. Can I do the New York nightclub thing and pay the front guy a couple extra dollars to jump the front of the line? And that's where you saw the spot rates start taking off because the ocean carrier sat there and said, you want to move your stuff to the front of the line? We can do it for you. You just got to pay an extra one, five thousand dollars, whatever it happened to be. And, and then you had new entrants into the field and the, uh, the, the, the ports were like, hey, we're wide open. Come on in. And they basically double booked. Uh, and, and so they couldn't accommodate everybody. And so there was a lot of issues that all went into that. Right. And so the consumer demand, almost everything that the consumers demand, you and I could demand, that comes in containers. Uh, you said a large container ship, and that is, you know, I'm sure you know most people watching this have seen it. It is that large metal crate that that can fit a lar large volume of packaged goods and and the like. But there's two other sort of main types of shipping. Uh, one is dry bulk, and one is uh, tankers, right? So tell us what are those two, and uh, did they all go up at the same time? Uh, are they all they, you know, are they declining 
faster? Like, tell us uh, the difference between them. Sure. So, I mean, the container was what got a lot of attention, obviously, because everybody saw the parking lot off of LA and Long Beach. Everybody saw a container uh, uh, shipping lines rate spike, and they saw their stocks also increase dramatically. Uh, companies like Zim, for example, were very popular. Everybody was watching them. In the the bulk sector, you have dry bulk, and dry bulk can be anything from ore, you know, uh, iron, steel to coal, uh, and then also grain, which is really a big issue right now with what's happening in the Black Sea and Russia and Ukraine. And the bulk trade is a very interesting one to watch because it is the biggest growing sector in shipping. Nobody ever understands that. Everyone is so fascinated by containers, but it's the bulk market that's really the biggest. And for example, most people tend to think China is a huge exporter. They're also a huge importer of raw materials, uh, particularly coal and material rare earth minerals and iron coming in. And so we're literally picking pieces of the earth up, putting them into large voluminous ships and moving them around. And, and this is in different elements of trade. So when you start talking about bulk uh, iron, for example, and, and coal, those tend to be very large vessels. Uh, and these are vessels that sail pretty much transoceanic voyages, you know, from Western Australia to China, from Brazil around the Cape of Good Hope to uh, Asia. Uh, those tend to be the big ones. And then the medium size to the smaller ones are, tend to be the grain ships. These are the ships that provide food, uh, wheat, corn, sunflower uh, seeds, you name it. And those are the ones that provide the food commodities. And the really important thing in the bulk trade to watch is not just tonnage, but also the voyages, the ton miles. And this is true in the tanker trade, which we'll talk about in a second, is, is how the tanker trade changes in terms of volume of not just the amount of cargo, but the distance it covers. You know, So if you have a ship that's doing normally six voyages a year, but now all of a sudden, because of a closure of a port or because of a demand, it now has to travel twice that distance. It's only getting three voyages in a year which means it has to raise its rates to make up that offset cost. And so that if you're the purchaser of that, that grain or ore or whatever it happens to be, you're paying more for it. In the tanker market, again, you have kind of three subsets. You have what's called the crude sector or the dirty sector. Uh, crude oil is, is exactly that. This is oil that needs to be taken from where it's basically taken out of the ground, either ashore or at sea, and then brought to refineries to be done. And, and crude oil, once you put it in a tanker, is a dirty tanker. You can't really put clean products in it. Clean tankers are, or product tankers are gas, diesel, uh, uh, any sort of refined gasoline. They tend to be smaller, but this is where we saw, for example, the issue with diesel uh, shortages in the Northeast. You know, one of the things I'd be very careful of telling people is if you remember when diesel and gasoline was short in the Northeast, it really wasn't. What you had was a lot of speculation going on where diesel, gas and diesel was being pulled out of the Northeast and sailed across to Europe because it was much more profitable to sell that in Europe than it was to sell it in the Northeast of the United States. And then the last element you have in here is the liquefied natural gas. Uh, liquefied natural gas and also liquefied petroleum gas is the other one. These are special uh, carriers that refrigerate basically a gas down to a liquid and you can move it across the, the, uh, the earth in these, these mobile carriers. This, uh, the tanker market has been turned on its end because of what happened in Russia and Ukraine. All of a sudden, you don't have gas and oil coming out of Russia. You don't have liquefied natural gas coming out of Russia. And so you have to make up for that. So for example, early in 2022, the US became the largest exporter of LNG in the world. We surpassed Australia and Qatar. But then you had the Freeport explosion down at the LNG facility that knocked the US off that precipice, but we're slated to get back up again when that facility resumes back to full production later in the year. And so the tanker market, those rates are still very high, but the, we are seeing some falling in dry bulk and container shipping. But they're, but they're not falling as much as some had anticipated. Right. I, I think the biggest one you see falls in is, is containers because containers were at Mount Everest. I mean, they were at the highest we've ever seen. Even if you go back to pre-2008, because that was the big level. I, I mean, pre-2008 recession, containers were at this huge super level. 
but what happened after 2008 beyond the recession was, again, overbuilding. The, 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 the ocean carriers got into the shipbuilding race where the container companies started building these mega ships. You know, if you go back 15 years ago, the biggest ships car carrying containers out there were maybe about 8,000 boxes. Uh, MSC just lost, uh, just launched a uh, Mediterranean shipping company, the, f the largest container carrier in the world, just launched a ship capable of carrying 24,000 boxes. So, you know, the scope and scale of these vessels is incredible. Think ever given in the Suez. Uh, and, and it's all economy of scale. Again, if you build a ship longer, wider, and deeper, you, you cube the volume of the vessel, which means you can carry more. And one of the things we saw was container rates went to this huge level that we'd never seen before. Now they're down. Now they're coming down off that. But a lot of people were talking about it falling off a cliff. I don't think we're falling off a cliff. I think we've kind of plateaued, you know. We're still high, you know, coming off the backside of Mount Everest, you know, it's still dangerous. You got to be careful. You know, you're only halfway down the tallest mountain in the world. So you can still die. Uh, and, and what we see here, too, is the container companies are a lot different than they were a few years ago. One of the things that's happened beyond the new build ships is since 2016, these container companies, especially the top nine, are in these three large alliances, what some people call a cartel. The president called it that in, in a State of the Union speech. But they get into these sharing agreements. And these three big alliances basically divvy up among themselves about a third of the route among each of them. So if you're going from Asia to the West Coast of the United States or East Coast or to Europe, uh, you basically see these large ocean carriers, these nine big companies that control 85% of all the containers afloat they are basically controlling that movement. And what we're seeing happen now as rates begin to fall and as cargo volumes begin to fall, it's still high. We're still at, you know, everyone's comparing everything to last year. And last year is the abnormal year. It was just a crazy year. But if you look at where we were pre-COVID, for example, we're way above where we were. And one of the things the ocean carriers are going to start doing is controlling the voyage of vessels. They're going to start cutting voyages because they want to keep those freight rates high. You got to remember in 2021, the ocean carriers, those top nine companies made as much profits in a single year as they did in the entire decade of the 2010s. It, it's just record profits. And ocean carriers want to get back to that. And they're going to do what they can to kind of manipulate the system as much as they can by controlling the supply of ships and containers to keep freight rates, not at the, the, the tremendous level they were, but at a much higher than they were. You got to remember pre-COVID, you're talking about moving containers for $1,500 to $2,000. At the height of COVID, you're talking about $25,000. Right now, we're talking about anywhere between six and $10,000, depending on the route. Sal, if you had to sum up, how would you assess the current health of the the shipping market. Well, I think ocean shipping is pretty strong right now. I, I still think, you know, everyone is talking about, well, it's, you know, we're coming off that peak. We're still pretty high up. I, I mean, it's still at a pretty commanding level that we're at. Uh, I, I think the ocean carriers are much smarter than they have been in the past. Uh, you know, I always got to get worried about the greed because once that kicks in, you know, will they start going against each other? Will they start, you know, trying to run each other out? Uh, I, I think that's always lingering on it. But I, I think the taste of profitability they saw, and, and like you said, you know, you look at those graphs of you know what the top nine container companies were making in 2010, and then you throw 2021, 2022 on there, and you're talking about 50, 60 million uh, billion, excuse me, 50, 60 billion dollars worth of profits, more profitable than Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, and Google. You know, it's just it's crazy amount of money. The variable here, too, I will also argue, is the amount of people who are getting into these stocks, again, who don't understand the, the stocks, who will sell and buy based on the, you know, what, 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 the, Walt, you know, what the Dow Jones does, what the, the S&P yeah. does, which is really completely independent of what's going on with shipping. Because what shipping is doing in many ways is in the forefront. It, it's already have accounted for it. So that when you look at commodities being hauled on dry bulk vessels or fuel, you, you already know what's happening. You know, you know, smart person sits there with with Russia, Ukraine and sits there and says dry bulk markets going up. Tankers are going to go up. They may not go up immediately, but they're going to go up just because of the disruption this is going to cause. Uh, and then the other issue, I think, that really with the market is when to get out, you know, because, again, 
it, it, unless you're watching it very closely, it's hard to tell when to get out because things are going to go bad. You know, I, I you know, again, I, I just watch the market take this huge tumble and everyone's like, sell, sell, sell. It's like, nope, don't sell a thing. It's going to tumble down. It's going to look terrible, but it's going to spring back up because this is just a correction that's taking place in the overall market, not in the industry itself. So I think ocean shipping is in a pretty good position. And if you look at the stocks of the shipping, uh, the carriers, <clears throat> shipbuilders, they had an absolute abysmal year from 2010 to you know to 2020, right before 2020. Why was that the case? Uh, what, was shipbuilding and, and uh, shipping a very bad industry, you know, unprofitable industry over the past 10 years? And if so, why? And does that compare? You know, historically, has ship shipbuilding been a profitable business, unprofitable business, or you know, is it was one of those businesses where you really got to count every penny because it's just not inherently a cash flow machine, like you know, let's say Apple compute, you know, Apple. Right. It's well, you know, shipping historically has been a long term. You know, it's a long term investment. You're in it for the long term. You're not going to see quick runs. But one of the things that's very unique about shipping, and we usually saw it in the tanker market. This is where you saw it more than anything else was in the tanker market, where if you were in at the right time, at the right moment, you make all your money. You know, you make all your money at one moment if you're investing in stocks. If you're shipping companies, you would make money in one quarter sometimes because all of a sudden the rates would happen or you were in an advantageous position to be in where all of a sudden you're in good. So, you know, for the tankers in 2020, when all of a sudden everybody stopped driving, all of a sudden, there was all this gas and diesel being made that wasn't being consumed. And so if you had a tanker, you made a fortune just having your tanker sit there loading fuel and not going anywhere. It was great. It was just literally you're were, you were, you were, you were renting out your tanker as a storage facility. And, and so one of the things we've seen historically in shipping is, is, you know, if you watch the market close enough and you can read kind of the tea leaves a bit, you can invest at the right time, make a lot of money and dump back out and get out. The rest of the time, you got to be in it for kind of for the long haul. And, and one of the things we saw with containers in the 2010s was just, I would argue that the, the companies that were involved at the time were doing a lot of things to run their competition out. So they were very predatory against each other. So they were building these big new ships. Again, they thought economy of scale. I, I'm going to get my, low, my freight rates, my, my costs down because we're operating in low freight environments. So the way I make money is by hauling a lot of containers cheaply. Well, when demand goes down and everybody's doing that, you run into problems with that. And then your other option is to slow the ships down because you're not burning as much fuel. And, and so what you saw was a lot of cutthroat elements there. You saw a lot of container liners go down. Again, go back 15 years ago, the top 10 companies carried 50% of the containers. Today, the top 10 companies carry 85% of the containers. And so what you saw were companies like Hanjin Marine, which was a Korean company in 2017, go under because basically a group of container companies ganged up on it and, and basically ran it out of business. Uh, these alliances now are coming under a lot of scrutiny in the United States, the passage of the Ocean Shipping Reform Act. And even in the EU, the consortium that allows this to happen is being analyze. So right now, there's a lot of money to be made in containers. Everybody's seeing that. They're seeing the profitability of them. They're seeing cash dividends from companies like Zim and Matson. Matson had, had a great second quarter, just fantastic. They're making money great. The question is, what happens with it? And you got to be very careful because they're not interchangeable, a lot of these container companies. They operate in very unique routes. Matson, for example, operates in the coastal protected route of the U.S. They control the Hawaii to U.S. trade. Whereas Zim is a global contender, they, they operate on, on, on the world scale as an independent, but probably going to see them fold into an alliance fairly soon. And so you know, fold into alliance means they're bought out, not bought out, but they start operating with other companies. And so they start working in a sharing agreement with them so that they won't compete against those companies and they'll make sure they get a share of the route to them. Yeah, just to give it just to give an example for, for the audience sure. of how profitable these companies are. You know, yes, they had a very bad decade over the past decade, but I think Zim, the, the company you mentioned, a, a charter company out of Israel, they paid a dividend in the first quarter of 2022, and that dividend was more than the stock IPO'd at <laughs> in 2021. <laughs> it was it was a fun, I mean I mean if you're going to IPO a, a container liner, if Zim had the time, you know, they, 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 they definitely were on the right moment at the right time to do that. And again, you know, shipping companies were one of those stocks that's, it's, it's very interesting to follow. 
because again, there was only a few people following them and they tended to be very niche. Not a lot of people looked at it. And, and what you saw was all of a sudden everyone saw, well, this is great. I'm going to make money in shipping. It's the way to go. But you got to be very careful because when it takes that downturn, it takes the downturn fast. So for example, in container shipping right now, you know, everybody was forecasting, okay, we're going to see freight rates plummet off and therefore stocks are going to plummet. That's not happened yet. And in, in, in what we saw was the second quarter coming in for all these companies is record profits still coming in. Now, you need to be aware that this is going to happen. The, the downturn is on the horizon. It's going to be the end of 2022 into 2023 where we're going to see those things happen. That's the natural moment when freight comes down. We didn't see it this year because we we're still operating in a COVID. I know everyone forgets, but we we're, we we're still in a COVID environment. And I would argue that the economy hasn't quite figured out yet what the consumers want, because now we've got people shifting to work from home. There's still a lot of flux in the economy right now. And again, the, the, the recession or the looming potential of a recession has people changing their buying patterns. But shipping doesn't change very quick when it comes to buying patterns. Again, you got to be 120, 180 days in advance. And, and we still see record volumes coming in. And one of the other things we're seeing is, is the shipping companies are being very adaptive. They are changing things. You know, the, the, the log jam at LA and Long Beach, for example, that everybody saw last year is not happening. There's not 100 ships off LA and Long Beach. There's 15 off LA and Long Beach, but there's 40 off Savannah now. Because what ocean shippers have realized in working with freight forwarders and the people who move cargo is we can't put everything through L.A. and Long Beach. Instead, we're going to use these new vessels and haul our cargo from Asia to Europe and then smaller vessels across the Atlantic. Or we're going to use the new lane of the Panama Canal opened in 2016 with these large Neo Panamax vessels. And we're going to sell directly to the east coast of the United States. We're going to bypass L.A. and Long Beach. We're going to come right here to a port like Savannah that is open for business, just dredged, plenty of land to buy to build warehouses. And we're seeing a big shift in where goods come in and out of this country. On the demand side, COVID changed everything. But on the supply side, what are the bottlenecks? Is there not enough ships or is there not enough ports? What is the reason that supply is not coming to meet this awesome demand? Ships are not a problem. We got plenty of ships and we're building more ships. And so, you know, when you look at the building market, this is another element that's really important. What we're building right now is container ships. That's what's being built. Dry bulk and tankers are not being built. Which, Why? Which, well, there's a couple of reasons. Number one, the demand has been down. Tankers are, have been at the lowest level they've ever been. And, and what we're starting to see is the tick up now in tankers. Tankers are finally coming up. Everyone's been predicting a rise in tankers for years. And it just it, it, it's, it's one of those markets that are just pendulate. But one of the things we're starting to see now, and again, Russia, Ukraine has, has been a big influence of this, is that now all of a sudden the movement of oil, of, of refined products, of LNG is in up demand. And therefore, we're starting to see that. So when you look at companies like Scorpio and, and, and Ardmore and Euronav and DHT and OSG, uh, Overseas Shipping, uh, which is, a, I think, one of the big companies out there that's boom ready for a boom. They, there was a, a, an attempted takeover of it last year that kind of failed because it came in too low. But here's a company that operates in that protected trade of the United States, but also has an international component to it. I think you're about to see that happen. But Again, we're building containers because of the demand. The demand is up on that. But the other thing you have is a big regulatory issue. We're in 2022. There's new regulations coming in about ship fuel and emissions. And the big goal is to reduce emissions in ships by 50% by 2050. That's put out there by the UN's International Maritime Organization. Lifetime of a ship is about 20 to 25 years. So you got to think, if you're buying a ship today, that ship has got to be compliant with reductions in emissions over because it's phased. It's not all of a sudden 2050 you're down 50 percent. So you got to put a engine plan or the ability to update a vessel at time. And so a lot of ocean carriers are putting off building anything right now because of that, because they don't know what the new fuel source is going to be. It's going to be liquefied natural gas. It's going to be ammonia. It's going to be a uh, 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 hybrid. Nobody knows. And the reason containers are being built right now is because there's a market for it and there's a demand for it and therefore they're going to build them. So is it just that the, the clean uh, uh, vessels, 
they are not able to be built yet. That the vessels that the shipping companies know that they need, they don't know exactly what they are, and no one's capable of building them yet. Or, or is, is it just something else? Yeah, it's it's, it's no one's sure what the new technology is going to be. It, it's going to be what's the next technology? You know, you know, if if you want to, for example, build a liquefied natural gas ship that runs purely on liquefied natural gas, well, you need a huge amount of it on a ship. Where you see those ships right now are really in what's called the feeder service. They operate short runs, smaller vessels. So for example, Hawaii to West Coast, or West Coast to Alaska, or, or very small. Transoceanic is a big problem because that's a lot. What you see with LNG ships right now is smaller tanks on bigger ships, they just burn it when they come within the coastal waters of a country. But you have, for example, LA talking about going zero emission from Shanghai to LA by 2030, that's eight years. You know, that's 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 a crazy number to come to. Uh, but they're talking about creating these green corridors where you can operate. And so a lot of companies are waiting for what's going to be the next thing. Plus, you got to have availability of that fuel. You have to have bunkering capacity. It, it's not like you just pull up to a pump and you, you flow hydrogen or liquefied natural gas. You've got to have all that facilities in place and you got to have the supply for it coming in. So there, there's a lot of logistics involved in this. And so ship companies are slowly introducing new technology into vessels, but no one wants to jump in and be saddled with a ship that may be obsolete in five to 10 years because the new technology appears and we can't change it. It sounds like there's a, a little bit of a disconnect between the price of tankers and the future supply of tankers based on what you just said and the current spot rates for for carrying them you know if you figure if a if a house uh you know is worth x you know ideally it would generate like five percent in rent and those two things ideally should be correlated if the uh carrier rates have gone up so much for tankers why are the ships themselves still relatively cheap right well you know i i think where you see that is in the the bulk market actually so you know you, you know when you saw the market take the tumble it did last month and, and everything tumbled down and if you look at stocks stock you know a lot of the shipping stocks tumbled down the the dry bulk tumbled down which made no sense let me be clear it made no sense for it to tumble because they were in a good position they they were again with with the, with the shutdown of grain coming out of ukraine the the sanctions against russia we saw a dry bulk really tick up in huge numbers. I mean, they were, they were moving food. There was a huge demand for them. And I think a lot of people are getting involved in shipping, you know, who are new to it. And again, it's following the market in some ways. But what you saw, which just recently is the correction. I mean, all of a sudden it's back up again. And, and we're seeing that with dry bulk. All of a sudden it takes this huge kick back up all of a sudden. And tankers are very much that same way. Again, people think tankers are, are, are in some cases generic and they're not. They're very particular. So if you look at a Euronav or a TK, for example, that's crude. That's that's moving crude oil around, much different than refined products. So if you start looking at, at refined products, you know, then you're looking at DHT, you're looking at OSG, you know, and you see that market, how they react a lot differently. And, and again, you see where the demand kicks up. Again, the the issue with Russia and Ukraine has been the overarching issue along with the change in demand of fuel. As COVID has worn off and now people are traveling again, we're seeing that uptick in the, the amount. And, and again, it's been hard to explain why tankers have been so low for so long. Because again, they, they should be kicking back up and they just have not done it for a long time. And I think a lot of people get afraid of it because they, they invest in it and then they don't see that all of a sudden that huge massive windfall that people talk about but again, when it happens, it happens quick. You know, if you were in tankers in early 2020, you made a tremendous amount of money very quickly because all of a sudden it happened. Usually it's very much locational. Hurricane comes rolling into the into the uh, Gulf of Mexico. If you happen to have tankers in the right area, you make a lot of money all of a sudden. You know, this is a global phenomenon. And, th and that's the thing. When we have global issues, that's what really pushes the tanker market a lot. And, and we're seeing that. And I think, for example, LNG is the one to watch a lot right now because it's a cleaner burning fuel. There's huge demand. Remember, our biggest exporters of LNG has been China, Japan and South Korea. But now Europe is 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 demanding huge amounts of LNG. And so the question is, where do you do? You know, can we meet that demand going in? The Freeport explosion slowed that down. Qatar is in a really good position because they don't just produce it. They also have the ships to carry it. 
So they mm-hmm. can control a lot of the market in some ways. And, and, and it, it's, it's the technology side on ship propulsion is, I would argue, the one thing that's holding everyone back or else we'd see a huge shipbuilding spree right now. I think that's the issue that's that's got everybody really nervous. The the cost I, I think of natural gas in Europe is something like five times higher than the cost of natural gas in the U.S. The problem is you have to liquefy that natural gas and then put it on a transoceanic uh, uh, ship. What is the capacity like that for in, in in that in the U.S. And then I know what are the sort of companies that do that. I know there's uh, Flex LNG, FLNG is the ticker, and then also a huge company, uh, Chenier. LNG, they most of their operations are uh, producing liquidified natural gas, but they also ship it, right? Right, and, and those are two of the big ones I would argue to to watch. And, and again, the U.S. has seen you know since 2016. Remember, LNG was not an issue at all in the United States. It's put, you know pre fracking. This was not anything. We, we we export almost no LNG at all. And when you look at EIA's reports on this, and you just see this growth. I mean, just it's, it's phenomenal amount of growth in this coming in. Uh, it, it has been a huge demand. LNG tankers, however, are the most expensive ships to build because of the technology involved. You have to get the temperature down, I mean, 200, uh, negative 200 Celsius. So, I, I mean, it, it's a lot of technology involved in it. And plus, you need the transfer facilities to be able to offload it. It's not like pulling up to a dock and offloading this. You need the facilities. That's been the big issue in Europe right now is because they were getting so much liquefied natural gas by pipeline, They didn't have the facilities ashore to do it. And so one of the things you're seeing is these vessels, these uh, um, um, these uh, basically these intermediaries between the LNG tankers and shoreside facilities coming in where they're pumping to. And and so Europe is developing it and Europe is fast tracking this. This is going to be a fast track for Europe for them to be able to do it. They can't wean themselves off Russia as fast as they want. I know we hear about sanctions against Russia all the time. But they can't wean themselves off as fast as they like to say. I mean, you're not talking about until Christmas 2022, some of these sanctions even kicking in. And so the demand in Europe is spiking. At the same time, you still have that massive demand in Japan, South Korea, and China for it. China is is, is the biggest one right now. And again, they're getting it from Australia. They're getting it from Qatar. And so this mark has been really good. And understand the Russian fleet was a big carrier of it, too, because they were making liquefied natural gas up in the Arctic. And so they had been a big carrier of it. Now, they have vested a lot of their fleet. They're trying to play a, a bit of a shell game right now in getting those ships under different companies and different flags so they can operate. But, yeah, I think Flex uh, LNG is one of the big ones to watch, in my opinion. I, I, I think you definitely see them. I, we've had a series of incidents, but, again, I mentioned Freeport. There was another one in Oklahoma Recently, I, I, again, I think demand has increased so quickly that in some cases, not all the necessary safety precautions are probably being taken. I'm a little worried that you're going to see a backlash of that in the U.S., that they may re- really try to restrict that. We've seen the slowdown in getting new LNG ports built in Texas. There, there are three in Texas, one in Louisiana that have been over a year now, waiting to get the permission from the Maritime Administration to open up. So, I mean, we're seeing the potential for growth, but until those permits come out, you know, you've got a lot of LNG bottled up in the United States that can't get out as fast as it needs to. So, Sal, you're a historian, so you've studied a lot of maritime cycles where shipping rates explode higher and then they, they crash. What are typical features of those instances where shipping rates fall drastically? Is it mostly due to a recession or a slowdown in demand? And also, what can you apply based on based on what you what, what you learned? Like, what what do you see in this cycle? Do you think that we are in a a sort of a, more of a mid cycle slowdown, or do you think you know shipping rates could truly crash as they have before? What what has driven this before? And uh, Martin Stopford, who wrote Maritime Economics you know, talks about shipping cycles. And I think he has it all the way back to the 1700s where he tracks literally like every shipping cycle that has ever existed. Uh, You know, there's a couple of things that throw off shipping cycles. One is technology. Technology has been, you know, the introduction of the clipper ship, uh, the introduction of steam power, you know, uh, the introduction of the trans, uh, uh, the, 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 the submarine cable, which, which all of a sudden linked the world together so that you can route ships better 
came in. You know, most people don't tend to think about communications that way, but it was a really big thing. Instead of sailing to a port to see if you can sell a cargo, now you're getting information where to go with your cargo to sell it is better. So yeah, technology has always been that big issue. And I think that's one of the big things we're watching right now. Shipping companies have got a lot of cash in their hands. And, and you know, I make a joke that, you know, sailors with money in their hands are dangerous. You know, they're either, they're either going to do something very smart or very stupid. And, and, and shipping companies are flush with cash right now. And a lot of them are investing in this new technology. I, I think one of the things you're going to see is increase in ship costs just to build ships because we're changing technologies. We've seen it right now with, with, with transportation costs. One of the underlying currents no one ever wants to talk about is the increased cost of fuel oil right now. It's just it's through the roof. I mean, it's just really expensive to bunker a ship. And that gets passed on to the shipper and turned on to the consumer. I, I think, you know, the big moment is going to be the end of this year, the beginning of next year. You know, there's always typically January to March is when freight drops. I mean, just the amount of ocean freight typically drops. You've got you've, you've got the end of the uh, of the holiday season in Europe and in North America. You have Golden Week and, and, and Lunar New Year in China. Uh, and so March has historically been like the low point. But if you look at the past two marches, they've been record high. I mean, they've been just ridiculously high. And I think we're going to still see high freight rates. I think, again, consumers have shifted their buying patterns. People are buying and ordering things more than ever before. And I think, you know, whether it's the grocery store picking up your bags of food or ordering online and having stuff shipped right to your house, you know, you've seen that. So I think the ocean freight rate, you know, a lot of people want to talk about onshoring technologies and goods. As long as it's cheaper to move goods across the ocean, and even though a freight rate may be five times higher than it was, you know, if, if an ocean container costs fifteen hundred dollars a ship, but now it's ten thousand, how much is that if you spread it across an ocean container full of phones, for example? You know, it goes from what a penny to two pennies, maybe, or five pennies. It, it, it's not a lot. Some goods will change, obviously. So I, I think we're really at that inflection point. If we see a crash in freight, it's going to be. December into March, where we would see it happen. But I think it's really driven by the overall economy. If we hit that recession and people realize they have less money in their hands, then we're going to see it. And the other problem you have, too, and it's a really important one, is that so many goods have piled up within the supply chain from the ports to the consumer that they got to clear that backlog. They got to keep clear that backlog. And so what they keep doing is lowering the price of goods and people are like, I got to buy it. It's too cheap. I'm going to keep buy it. And eventually, if that dries up, then you got to restock. And that may be a moment where we see shipping kick back up. So I, I think we're more at a midpoint here. But I, it's a midpoint. I think we're going to see a, a, a normally you would see just one dip. I think we're going to see two. We're seeing the dip right now from COVID. I think we're going to see another dip down. And then conceivably, we'll see it spring back up in 2023. And then maybe we get back to what the new level will be. But again, I, I go back to the issue with the ocean shipping companies. They are much smarter today than they were five years ago. And they've got a taste of profits. They know how to manipulate the system a little bit now. And they realize what they need to do to keep their rates up at a high level. But a sailor with money in their hands is dangerous. <laughs> it is dangerous. I was one myself. I believe me, I know this. Sal, how sensitive to the economy are shipping rates? And and um, you know, I, I know that they are very sensitive. But is is container rates uh, are they more sensitive than dry bulk rates or, or uh, um, tanker rates? Just because it's the consumer, or are they equally sensitive? And you know, if if we had a if we are, if we were in a recession already, and you know the the PMIs were coming in mid forties, um, real growth slowing for a third quarter. We've already had two quarters of of real GDP growth uh, sl slowing down. You know, how how bad do you think this could get in terms of sh shipping rates? Well, I think in terms of the container companies, again, you know, they're much more concentrated in the hands of smaller co of of larger companies, but less less of them. And so they're more able to control the rates now than they've ever been in the past. 
So again, you know, they can just lay ships up. And, and this is going to happen, by the way. Let me be clear. Container companies are going to scrap vessels like crazy once this market begins to dry up. Everyone's worried about the overbuilding in the container companies. My argument is, well, listen, they're running ships that shouldn't be running anymore. They're at the end of their lifespan. They would be very uneconomical ships to run any other time but right now because the freight rates are so high. So what, what you're going to see is a mass exodus of ships heading to the beaches in Pakistan, India, Turkey, and Bangladesh to be recycled. And so they're going to weed themselves of these this tonnage. And so they're going to be able to control the amount of space on, on ships moving across. The, you hear a lot about, well, there's other, you know, there's new players in the market. They're really, really small. They, 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 they're providing niche services here and there. They're nowhere near the size of the big companies. And so the big companies. What sort of what sort of small companies do you hear about? So I'm not in the shipping world. So, I, I <laughs> so there are companies like CU Lines, SM Lines. The, these these were typically smaller feeder companies, uh, Express Lines. They were doing a lot of services. You know, maybe run a few thousand miles between ports. They would bring containers from smaller ports to bigger ports to load on the bigger vessels, or vice versa. What happened in 2020 was all of a sudden they. they, they some of these ships said, well, you know, I'll I'll get your cargo from Shanghai to L.A., you know, and I'll, I'll pack 500 containers on here for you and I'll move this ship off and I'll get it over there. And so all of a sudden, all these new companies came in and you heard Gene Soroka and Mario Cadero, the heads of the ports of L.A. and Long Beach, talking about, oh, it's, it's we, we've diversified. We've got a lot more new players in. But small percentages, small percentages they were bringing in the big, you know, the Maersk, the, the Mediterranean shipping companies, the Hop Hogs, you know. These are the ones that are behemoths. I mean, they are just gargantuan compared to these other guys. And they can basically control this. So you're going to see these companies be much smarter in their operations. They're going to weed the, get rid of this tonnage. They're going to bring in more fuel-efficient vessels, vessels that they can swing between routes better. So, for example, one of the biggest you know ships we're seeing built right now are these Neo-Panamax vessels. These ships that can go through the new lane of the Panama Canal that opened in 2016 – and you can bypass L.A. and Long Beach and go directly to the East Coast from the from Ch Asia and still carry 15,000 boxes. You know, the old lanes, you can only fit 5,000 box ships. Now you're bringing 15, 16,000 box ships. And now you don't go to one port, L.A., you go to four ports on the East Coast. You go to Savannah, you go to uh, uh, Norfolk, you go to New York, New Jersey, you go to Houston. And, you know, which means you're only offloading 20, 30 percent of your cargo. But more importantly, you're bringing the cargo closer to the population because what was eating you if you're offloading in L.A. and Long Beach was the constraints, the time. And then you had to get on rail largely and get it from, you know, L.A. Long Beach to Dallas, to St. Louis, to Kansas City. And so that was especially with the rail lines killing you. Now you can bring it right into Savannah, where the Southwest population is, or to Houston, the Southern population, or New York, New Jersey, the Mid Atlantic, New England, and get it directly to them. But this also involves a lot of investment by companies in warehousing and storage areas. But it, it gets them out of LA and Long Beach, which they just see as a black hole in some cases. You got to remember, LA and Long Beach was handling 40% of all the containers coming in, and it was only growing. And now these new ports are really competing with them. And that's why you saw a lot of investment over the past 10 years in Savannah, Houston, New York, New Jersey, dredge, raise the Bayonne Bridge, new facilities so you can bring these larger vessels in. Yeah, I mean, that just sounds incredibly more efficient and cost effective, uh, shipping something from Shanghai to New York instead of shipping it from Shanghai to L.A. and then having to put it on a rail. I mean, that's just Game changer. Yeah, and, and you know, if you look at the freight rates now, and you look at these indexes, which kind of take the average of it, you know, if you look at the Fredos uh, Baltic uh, Container Index, you know, from Shanghai to L.A. Long Beach is six thousand and change, but to the East Coast, it's nine thousand and change. And you'd sit there and go, "Wow, why am I paying an extra three thousand for a container?" But if your reliability is a lot better, you know, I know I can get this ship in. I know I can offload it, and plus, I don't have to worry about rail. I've got a shorter transportation land. Uh, Bridge I got to deal with. I'm not warehousing it. I'm not dealing with detention and demerge charges because the port of LA and Long Beach is backed up. Then you're willing to pay, you know, some people are willing to pay that little extra money for the better reliability. 
because that's something else we've seen is just a, a fall off a cliff of reliability. Oh, you know, pre-COVID, the reliability, you know, the time you would get your container delivered to you on time was about 70 to 80 percent. Now it's, you know, at the height of COVID, it was in the 30s. You know, now it's bouncing between 30 and 40 percent. And so, you know, people who are shipping sit there and go, listen, I'm willing to pay an extra three grand for a container. Again, because you spread it across the entire contents of a container. You know, unless you're shipping couches, you know, which is, you know, yeah. large volume cargo, you know, you can spread that across and it, it's more efficient for them. So I'm just, I've just got the the Freightos, uh, just the global container freight index. And as you mentioned earlier, the price skyrocketed from $1,500 to uh, $10,000, $11,000, I think, at, at the peak. And now it's down to $6,100. So obviously, you know, the uh, shipping companies, the container companies were printing money at $11,000. But how profitable is $6,000 for them? And you know, what are their costs? What, what are the biggest costs? Is it, is it labor? Is it buying the ship? Do they have debt on the ship that they have to pay interest on? Walk me through sort of what their, their income statement would look like based on where the freight rate is. Sure. So, uh, I mean, labor costs are, are pretty low for them because, again, one of the things that you're seeing is they're shopping around the world for the cheapest labor. So, you know, the most common mariners are from Philippines, India, Russia, which has been a bit of a problem recently, Indonesia and India. And so, you know, they can keep their freight rates, I mean, their, their labor costs down pretty much. Again, they've built larger vessels, economy of scale. You know, one of the things that we talked about 15 years ago, you know, ships are tremendously bigger, went from 5,000 to 20,000 TEU, but the crews have gone down because of automation and, and, and elements, you know, where you needed a 35 person crew, now you need 25. So that has gotten a lot cheaper for them. Fuel has been the one thing that's really ticked up quite a bit. And again, one of the things that we're seeing is a return to kind of slow steaming, to slow the ships down, to reduce down that fuel level uh, so that they're not burning as much. You know, ironically, one of the things that we saw was in January 1st of 2020, ships, there was a, a change in fuel. You had to go to this low sulfur fuel oil because of sulfur emissions. This was part of that phased element of emissions. And so ships either had to buy the very low sulfur or install what's called scrubbers, which basically scrub the exhaust. And what we're seeing right now is those ships that installed scrubbers are making money because they can buy cheap fuel. They don't have to buy the very expensive fuel, but those are going to be phased out. You can't operate scrubbers after I think it's 2024. So they've got to phase them out next year. So, you know, that's going to kick back up again for them. Again, we're seeing companies laying ships up, you know, just not sailing a vessel, you know, what they call blank sailing. And what we see is a lot of these ocean carriers right now are deferring the building of their vessels. And instead, they're leasing a lot of vessels from these non-owner operators, companies like C-SPAN, Atlas, uh, Custom Air, uh, which are really good investments right now. I mean, if you look at what happened with Atlas and C-SPAN, this takeover bid, uh, it's a really interesting one. Yes, so there a lot of carrier companies are leasing ships. They're not, they don't own the ships. They're leasing ships. And Zim does that too, right? Oh, Zim, Zim is probably the, the classic case of that. When you look at Zim a year ago, they only owned one ship. They operated 100, you know, but they were basically just uh, leasing the rest of them because, again, they were not sure what the market was going to do. So they went to leasing firms uh, and, and these, these NOOs, as they're called you know, would build these ships. They'd get these great deals because they'd build 20, 30 ships at a time. And they're basically the U-Haul of the sea, you know, basically, you know, they just rent them out uh, to do it. But you look at, again, Atlas is, is or C-SPAN, which is a subset of Atlas, is a great example of that. You know, they've been able to lease out every one of their vessels. They've got contracts through 2024 into 2025. And basically, they have paid off nearly all their vessels so that whatever they're taking in right now is going to upkeep, maintenance, and basically profitability. Right. And, and so if you're renting a ship, obviously what you don't want to happen is, is you lease a ship for, let's say, a month. I know that to do that. but And then shipping rates explode higher. You make all this money. But then you have to constantly re-up re your contract. And I'm guessing the leasing the person who's leasing their ship will charge higher rates. But uh, Zim... And a lot of these companies, they've leased them out for, for years, right? So those are profitable. So who, so who's in a better position? Well, I, I think the people who own the lease are the best ones. I mean, they're renting the ships. They, they, are, they are just kicking back and, and, and loving this because they've got great deals. So that even if the ships come back in 2024 and 2025 and there's no one to lease them, they pay them off. I mean, they'll lay them up cold and sit there, but there'll be a, a demand and need for them 
going on. Zim, for example, started building ships because they they realized, okay, we're we're leasing like crazy here. We we need to have some ships built. And most container companies go to like Alpha Liner and you look at the list of the top container liners and they break it out by the number of ships they own versus the number they charter. You know, and, and usually what they'll do is they'll have a good core fleet of vessels that are their own, and then in turn they'll plus up. What happened in 2020 is, you know, again, I could have gone in business with a rowboat and moved one container, and I could have probably have leased that for money. Uh, it was just if you had anything that floated, it's out there now. The amount of vessels that are like un that, that are not being used is infinitesimal right now. It's crazy how low it is. But as I mentioned to you before, too. A lot of ships are running that shouldn't be running. And so what you're going to see is this mass scrapping that's going to take place. So because of technology and because of the flexibility of vessels, you're going to see a lot of these vessels go out of service. And so it's going to be a big kind of circuit change what's going on. I, you know, For me, the NOOs are, the, are really, for me, what I watch because, again, they're, they're doing a smart move. They're out there leasing those vessels. They're filling in, and you know they were able to get some pretty good long leases with some companies back when everything was hitting. You know they got locked into one, two, three year long leases in some cases, not just a few months. So they were in a pretty good position to be in. And whether those ships sail or not, they make money. You know it, do, it doesn't matter if you get that car from from you know Alamo. You know they don't care if you drive it or not. You know they're getting their rental fee every day. And matter of fact, if you don't drive it, that's better for them because then it's less wear and tear on the ships. So, so the uh, roughly the container rates are at six thousand dollars, sixty one hundred dollars. At what point do uh, at what prices does it start to become unprofitable uh, for a lot of these shipping companies, where they start to get under pressure just because shipping rates are falling so much? Sure. So, I mean, I, th I think the the red line there is the pre COVID rates that fifteen hundred to two thousand. They don't want to return to that. that. That that's not what they want by any means. And so what we've seen so far is a lot of the ocean carriers, beyond investing in new technologies, are also diversifying themselves. Pre-2008, if you looked at ocean carriers, they owned the containers, they owned the chassis, they, they, they did a lot of the movement on and off the ship. They owned the terminals. But in 2008, when the global recession hit and they invested in these huge, large ships, couldn't get rid of the ships because they would lose money if they got rid of the ships. So what they did is they divested themselves of terminals, of containers, of chassis, everything they could have. Now they're being much more rounded. You got you got container companies buying air freight companies. They they're they're buying terminals back. Uh, 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 CMA CGM bought back the Phoenix terminal at LA, for example. So they they are once again creating a much more rounded economy for themselves. They're not solely based on ocean freight. So obviously, if the freight falls, that's bad for them. But they're they're in a they're in a much stronger position. And again, I, this is where I think these container companies are going to be a lot different coming out of a potential recession in 2020, whatever it happens to be, because one will happen, than it was in 2008. In 2008, they had so over leveraged themselves. They, they're almost like the, the passenger liners today. If you watch the, the, the information on Carnival and Royal Caribbean and, and uh, Norwegian, they had so invested themselves in the concept that this is always going to go up. It's never going to go down. We're going to invest in bigger and better ships. There's no problem here. It was, it was they were they were the real estate of shipping basically, and now they're suffering because they can't sell enough stock to get them out from and they can't sell the ships to anyone because who's going to buy a you know a five thousand person passenger ship? Nobody needs one of those. But the ocean freight companies are in a much better position than than they've been before, and even on the dry bulk and the and the tanker side. I think they'd much rather be smaller because they know that when it hits, their ships make more money per ship than ever before. They can, you know, they can make it. I don't think they're so worried about, you know, providing the, 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 the supply as much as when the demand hits, they're going to make some profitability here. You know, and, and if you look at the tanker market, for example, one of the things it did is it bled off those really big, massive ships. Because while they were great, huge economies of scale, they found the medium-sized vessels, what are known as MRs and LRs, medium-range and long-range vessels, were the better ship because you can drop it into more trade routes. If you had this huge, massive vessel, you can only go on certain routes. And I, the container companies are starting to see that. They need versatile ships, not just these big, huge monster ships that can only be used on the Europe to Asia route. You brought up the cruise liners. Yeah, that is, that is the fourth type of ship where they, they transport tourists often, often to you know 
uh, very friendly, uh, sunny destinations, the demand there has fallen off a cliff. I'm, I'm sure it's you know, somewhat restored, but in 2020, I mean, it fell 99. percent You know, uh, what is the out, what is your outlook on those types of, of companies? And um, yeah, I know that I know you know they're, financially they're, it's a little complicated because they've issued, as you say, like so much stock. Yeah, well, I, they made a critical error. Let me be clear. I, I mean, I, I think they thought in early 2020, this is going to blow over. And none of them did what they should have done, which was start laying ships up because they could not foresee this happening. And they were bleeding cash. When you look at, at Carnival and Royal Caribbean and Norwegian and you look at their, their reports for 2020 and 2021, I mean, they were just hemorrhaging money. And what gets with no revenue, no revenue, There's no revenue. But there was no there was literally nothing done to prevent the loss. I, I mean, they didn't lay the ships up. They had full crews sitting there. I mean, at one point there was like a parking lot off Bermuda and Bahamas that was fully staffed container uh, uh, cruise ships with nobody on board. And and, I, you know, again, they, they laud themselves all the time. But I think their management has to take a hit for this because they have not done the phased you know, coming back in the service, they keep thinking they're going to put 5,000 people back on Oasis of the Sea and it's not going to happen, you know, and, and they've done very little to, to manage that. I don't know. It's not, you're kind of dressed. You're kind of dressed like you want to go to on an Oasis of the Sea. I will always go on a cruise ship. <laughs> Let me be clear. I, I, I love cruise ships and I, I will go on them in a minute. But but I, I think they're, they need some management. Now, what's really interesting about the cruise lines is Carnival isn't just Carnival. It has subsidiary lines. Royal Caribbean Norwegian has that. And what you're going to see them do is bleed off some of these 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 lines. If it's bankruptcy, whatever it is, what we saw them do last year was start scrapping vessels. I mean, they just took old ships out of service and sold them. But the problem with scrapping them was they weren't even getting money on the steel that they should have been getting. Just the pure tonnage of the vessel was not paying them enough money. They just had to get them off their books. And so they were running ships aground. It was a, it was a great image in Turkey of about eight of them lined up carnival and royal caribbean side by side and and they and the other problem they had is their order book was full and and so they couldn't back out of orders they tried to slow them down but now oh of buying new ships buying yeah. new ships and so they were just again if you read the you know clea which is their 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 uh, a group that does represents all of them you know you read their reports and man it was like this is never going to stop being sunshine and, and and you read the delivery reports and ships were just bigger and bigger and, and more expensive and the more frills and and just nobody saw it. And, and so, you know, does Carnival Royal Caribbean and Norwegian go away? No. I mean, they're, they're not going to go away. But what you're going to see is a fundamental restructuring of them. Again, they're incorporated offshore, so they're not even a U.S. company. So, you know, they're in Panama, Bahamas and Liberia. They're going to bleed off ships. Uh, they're going to take substantial losses, but I do think there's an opportunity there. Investment, you know, when those stocks hit the lower again, look at out the five, ten years, and if you look at their past growth, you know, I would have told you in 2013 that when Costa Concordia went ashore off Sicily and 32 people died, this was going to have an impact on cruising because because this was pure human negligence. And the fact that more people didn't die was just due to, to, to happenstance. You saw a dip in the cruise industry for about six months, and then nobody remembers it anymore. And I think COVID's going to be that way. Once you get past the COVID elements and cruise lines start doing some smart things, which are starting to do shorter cruises, two, three day cruises, so that you don't ping COVID cases, you know, get them on and off the boat before anything happens. You know, yeah. is, is no. I'm serious. I think it's a smart. It's a smart move they're doing. What they're finding is these long voyages is what's killing them. They've got to be, right. go into ports that are much more safer for them to go into. Uh, once they start doing that, and again, it's going to go to top management how it goes. Carnival's the biggest one. They've got the most cushion because they are the biggest operator out there. They're more likely to get it. I think Royal Caribbean is in a good position. Norwegian is the one to worry about because they they've just got a smaller market than everybody else and they don't have as much cushion and yeah norwegian like the other companies in the the other cruise liners is very indebted yeah they well i I mean again they just i i just don't understand the operating procedure they were doing they just did not see what was coming and i don't think you had to really read the tea leaves too much to understand that a global pandemic is not going to make a lot of people want to get you know on a buffet line with five thousand other people in in the near future 
Sal, is it true that one of those cruise liners used to be a company that owned the Titanic? Uh, White, White Star, which became Cunard. So, uh, and that's actually a subset under Carnival right now. So the White Star and Cunard combined together. They run like the Queen Elizabeth, uh, uh, the Queen Mary, uh, Queen Victoria. So they, and, and they've been hitting very hard too because they tend to do these really long voyages you know, around the world, these, these multiple ones. Uh, and, and, and those are the ones that they have the biggest problems with because the longer the passengers are on, the more ports they hit, the more likely you are to have an outbreak on board. Yeah. So, so you'd, you'd say shorter cruises, those longer cruises where you stay in 100 days on a boat, those aren't coming back for a while. It depends where you're going. You know, there was just an announcement yeah. of a cruise going down to Antarctica for 154 days. So, you know, again, if you can afford that, that's great. But it, it does have to make some stops. And, and so there, there's that danger. And I think as we get better with COVID, we'll see that come back. I, I think what, what is happening right now with the cruise lines is they had put off this for so long and have tried to restart so many times. It's cost them so much money that now their debt is just they can't hide it anymore. You know, it, 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 you know too big to fail has been their mantra for a long time. But they, they just have tried to restart so many times and they just can't seem to get it to kick right now. And I, I, again, I think it's because of the management. I, I'm just really fundamentally amazed that, that, that their management, which pats each other on the back all the time, failed them miserably. Yeah. Uh, Sal, I've got a question. Are there futures on uh, freight in, for other freight futures on freight rates in the same way that there are futures on oil? They've been trying to do that with containers. So the, the future market for containers has been trying to get started. Uh, I have not seen it really develop. It's not something I've seen really mature yet. Uh, it, it, it'd be interesting to watch, but man, I, I got to tell you, it's it's pure. It, it, it's it, There's a lot of luck in that. It's just because, you know, how do you call it? Where do you see it? Because again, uh, the thing about ocean shipping is you can shift it so much, you know, so you can always move it around and being in the right place at the right time sometimes is pure happenstance. And, yeah. you know, you know, nobody really saw what COVID was going to be unless you were really attuned to what was happening. And as I mentioned to you before, you know, the tanker market is probably one of the best for that, where you're sitting there with a load of, of, of diesel on a ship and, and all of a sudden you see an opportunity to move it you know, in the futures that way. I, I, you know, the container one is an interesting one. And like I said, they, they've been talking about it. I know like Craig Fuller over at Freight Waves has talked about that, seeing about that's if something you can do. It's one of the reasons he started his outfit there was to try to read freight, kind of become like the Bloomberg of, of, of mm -hmm. ocean freight. Uh, but I, I haven't seen it really take off yet. The other positive about ocean shipping, I will tell you, is a lot more data out there, a lot more information out there so that you can follow this a lot better. Mm -hmm. I, I think, you know, you know, everything from new sources to good reporting out there. There's bad reporting out there, too. Be careful, because there's a lot of people who don't understand this at all. And they make cases. And, and, and you know, I, I can't tell you the number of people I heard talking about freight rates are falling off a cliff and this is the end. And, and, and it's like, you know, OK, it's it's not it's not it's not the sky's not falling here. You, you, yeah. you need to understand that. But, you know, if you watch it and, and understand it and, and again, I'm really encouraged by what I've seen. You know, the question is, how do they take this money? But the X variable I keep saying out there is this technology issue is, is what happens right. with this that's going to drive up the cost for shipbuilding and ship operation in the future. Sal, uh, obviously, you know, not investment advice from you or for, from, from me, but what company or type of ship do you think is, is best poised, poised to, to weather the next few years. Uh, and then also, yeah, where do you think the greatest risk are? What, what company or sector do you think is going to be the worst performing sector? Now, I watch a company like OSG, for example, in the tanker market right now. I think they're undervalued uh, immensely. Uh, I think there's a lot of opportunity here. There's also a government issue going on right now where the U.S. really wants to get more U.S. flag tankers in. So they're in a really good position right now, including a, a program that provides a subsidy to them. Uh, I, I think they're in, in in a good position to really go up. And plus, they, they're just ridiculously low. I got to say, their, their stock value has been undervalued. All tankers' stock value has been, in my opinion, undervalued 
for quite a, a long time. I think a lot of the product tankers are in a good position, you know, uh, DHT, International uh, Seaways. I think they're in good positions too to do it. I'm very unsure about the crude oil market. I think that's that's an issue. I think flex LNG is is LNG is is going to do nothing but increase, you know, I, I especially with the phase out of coal in a lot of a lot of you know you just saw Hawaii for example get its last shipment of coal so there's got to be a replacement for that LNG seems to be the appeal for a lot of people because it's a cleaner burning fuel good intermediary f uh, fuel for right now I you know I think the container market's an interesting one to watch I know it's coming down and and and, and but it's going to stabilize back out again and and it'll be interesting to see what some of these container companies do container companies are weird because a lot of them are privately held so you know you can't even invest in yeah. in some of them but when new companies come in i think zim has changed that model is what happens when you have an ipo like zim come out there because i i, I talked to a lot of people when zim was doing their ipo and they were sitting there going oh, this is never gonna work it's gonna never work it's like no this is a good idea for them to do this and and i I think I got overhyped for a long time. There was a lot of people on the Zim bad wagon. And in like February, March. Yeah, yeah. I did, man, it was just like, you know, and, and then, it, you know, people got off, they got back on. <laughs> it's just, you know, I, I think I think there, there there was a lot on that. But I, I think on the dry bulk side, too, I, I mean, we're, we're seeing a lot. Eagle, uh, which is a, a one I, I like to watch a lot. I think they're a great, solid company. Uh, I think they have a great leadership, you know, Corporate management, I think, is fantastic. I think they're they're well placed for where they're going to be. Uh, you know, these medium sized bulk companies are, are are really interesting to watch right now because, again, you know, something as simple as you know, hey, we're shifting over to electric hybrid power. Well, you're going to need a buttload of copper, you know, and copper can only be hauled by 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 these guys. So don't think for a yeah. minute, you know, I have a lot of people tell me, well, coal's going out, so bulks are going out. It's like no, it's like. The amount of ore you need to move is is increasing. And what we're seeing is a lot of that futures playing out there. It's like, well, let me get it from Brazil now. Well, I'm going to get it from South Africa now. I'm going to get it from West Australia now. Or I'm going to get it out of Canada now. And so you're seeing a lot of that movement take place. And there's a big return back to bulk shipping. And, and again, it's the biggest growing sector in, in shipping right now. Uh, it has been historically over years. We don't see them being built right now, but you're going to see them really change here in the future once we get through this container wave. So, you know, th those are kind of the companies I look at right now is, is really interesting to watch. And again, look at them long term. You know, if you want to make some quick money, man, you just got to be following it really closely. Yeah. And so what about company or type that you're the least constructive on that you think will have the encounter the most challenges? Well, I, I, I think, again, crude oil carriers are, are really one of the big challenges right now just because of that. Uh, the, the, Russia has thrown such a monkey wrench in things. You know, there was a great story by Greg Miller over at Freightways the other day where he talks about, well, you know, you know, they were shipping out, you know, to Europe like 700 uh, 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 billion uh, a million barrels a day, uh, you know, to Europe, and now they're shipping 800 million barrels to India, for example. And so, that's great until the pipeline comes in, and then that goes away. And 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 so, crude has been just one of those tough areas to really gauge. I think containers are going to come down. I mean, I, I expect I I, I expect yeah. to see that. I, I think they're the most volatile in the future here. There's going to be a fall. The question is, does it come? In the you know in the spring of 2023, or do we see it later in that year? And that's going to be geared on the recession. That's going to be geared on the world. You know, if you you follow world, you know, ocean trade, it it it's, it's correlates exactly to the containers. So I think that I think one of the strongest ones are you know, outfits like Custom Air, Atlas, C-SPAN, which are leasing the vessels. They're in good, mm -hmm. solid positions. They're returning dividends. They're they're just really really good right off the bat right now. Because it doesn't matter if the container market falls, they're, they've got leases, they've got ships going out, and they've got income coming in, whether the ships sail or not. Yeah, uh, I, I think that you know, for, for folks who they think that they're buying a LNG tanker, make sure that they actually, they, they should make sure they're actually buying an LNG tanker and not an, an oil tanker by accident. Uh, um, so my, my final question for you is, how much? How so? How much does seasonality matter? Because people say, "Oh, oh an oil like, um, you know, there's the this turnaround season in September." But really, it's like you know, plus one on WTI. 
you know, uh, relative to minus one. And, but, but is, is, um, you know, it's really the cycle and, and the fundamental flows that, that matter oil, like seasonality, it's, it's important, but it's not, you know, the be all and end all is, is it in shipping? Is it kind of the be all and end all where, you know, oh, wow, January to March, every single time it goes down. So the fact that it went up is is something to write write home about. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, if if you watch tankers and I mean, literally watch them go into like an, a, an app like Marine Traffic and you look at, you know, you will see the farm of tankers sitting off Singapore, fully loaded, ready to go, you know, and they're just waiting for the prices to spike and and then they're off and running, you know, and and and, and they go, you know, you you've got enough to keep the system up and up and running, but a lot of you know smart. Companies are prepositioning low cost oil at places and waiting for that spike to come up. So, yeah, the seasonality is, is again, if you're playing the stock just to make it in a quarter, then, yeah, you're watching the seasonality. But in the long term, again, you know, if you look at tankers historically, they've never been lower than before. I mean, they're at this this this, this massive low that they're coming out of. And I think we're starting to see them tick up. I mean, we, you know, the stories are out there that this is the best tanker market in 25 years and everybody's talking about it. I think you got to be careful about the hype about that, too, because, again, you got to know when to get out of it. But but I think they're in a pretty good position right now to see this, these, these global disruptions. And, and, you know, that's the other thing to remember is we're still in COVID and COVID created an ocean tsunami of disruptions. It, it, you know, no, we haven't really seen this since the world wars where ocean shipping has been disrupted as much. You know, we've seen isolated ones, hurricanes, political events, things happen. But the problem is, is the pool is pendulating with waves right now. And all these other events get thrown in the pool and they keep the waves going. They're subsiding. They're coming down. They're not as high as they were, but they keep coming in. And I use a phrase, you know, the black swan event used to be the one time event. Now, you know, it's, it's a swarm of black swans dive bombing us and, and we just can't seem to get out of it. So I think I think the oil market has the potential, specifically gas, clean, you know, clean product tankers, gas and diesel and LNG are probably the ones I'm watching the most right now and, and see the most potential coming in. I just could not tell you when I think it's going to kick. Because it, it just doesn't follow a lot of sane patterns at times. Uh, and, 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 and again, a lot of people made money early in 2020 when they were in tankers and all of a sudden it got in and they didn't get out fast enough because things bottomed out yep. very quickly. And, and, you know, that's the thing. You got to be willing to, 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 to get out of it because, again, it, it tends to spike and then come back down very fast. You can't fall in love. No. No, you, you yeah. have to be really, you know, I, I, jo- I joke with shipping guys all the time is you shouldn't name your ships. You should just leave them numbers, you know, because they, One, get, two, because they, get, they get too attached to them. They get too attached to them. They get they, they turn them into, you know, female kind of personalities. And, and, you know, trucking companies don't do it. They don't name their trucks. They don't name their planes. They just, yeah. you know, just get detached from it. Well, that's great advice. But Sal, I have to say, when I when I first uh, called you, I was what I really impressed, and I could tell that you were the, the right guy to talk shipping. Is that you talked about sh- shipping, and you said, "Oh, this ship, you know, she's she's getting off the coast of Panama," and so you you use the the, the female. Oh, pronoun. I'm terrible about it. I do it all the time. I can't help it. But you know, I, I'm, I'm talking about investors. Be detached. Be be. Be open from it. I'm a historian. I have to love these things. So I, I love ships yeah. to death. It, to me, they're one of my favorite things to talk about and look at. And again, you know, my, my background was I looked at, you know, I sailed them. I've looked at the history of them. But now I'm looking at how they're operating today. And I think it's a, I think it's a fascinating industry. I, I think, again, it, it, it's so outside the mainstream of so many people that they don't realize the potential and opportunity in there for career wise, for investment wise. To, to look at. But again, we keep it so detached from us. You can't go into a port. You can't really see these yeah. things. And so I think that's a lot of also hesitation by people to invest in them because mm-hmm. I, I don't understand them. I don't understand how they operate. I don't understand the system. How do I find out about it? It's one of the reasons I started a YouTube channel to talk about this is talk about how these systems operate so that people would not be so detached from them. Yeah. I was going to say, Sal, you have a fantastic YouTube channel that's called What's Going On in Shipping. And People should definitely check that out. Um, yeah, I, I've learned a lot from it. And yeah, what, what was that like? You know, being because you've been you've been a professor. Uh, what's it like teaching people online and like you know being a sort of a content creator? It, it's it's funny because uh, I'm so used to teaching students, and so I, sometimes I get professorial and I had to be careful. I kept repeating things, and people said your, your videos are way too long, dude. You're saying the same thing over and over again. It's like, well, yeah, I'm used to hammering it in the students' heads. So you know, yeah. it, it, it's a change. 
But it's really fascinating to me because, again, I could teach 20, 30 students in a classroom who may be interested, may not be. But I could post a video and get 20,000 hits, you know, and and yeah. and it, it's been really fun because, again, one of the things I try to do is is make shipping understanding to people and, you know, take this kind of macro view of of different sectors and different areas. You know, every week I do a, a weekly news show, What the Ship. So I just What's posted one today uh, today where I talked about the container sector. I talked about the tanker sector. I talked about, you know, different elements in there. And really make it understandable, and then I do features that go more in depth on them. Uh, but it's it's been really impressive. You know, I, I started the channel a little over a year ago when Ever Given went ashore in the Suez. I had you know three hundred subscribers, and I think the day before Ever Given went ashore, I had three people watch my channel. You know, and and today I've got forty six thousand subscribers and almost five million views. So it's 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 wow. it's crazy. It's just I'm not used to it. I'm I have people tell me you're an influencer. It's like no, just a history professor here at Campbell University. You're a ship fluencer. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I had somebody tell me that because uh, I, I tend to talk when uh, my, my videos go up when there's a maritime disaster. And I had one of the guys I sail with tell me, you sell, you're the face of maritime disasters. And I, I, I said, I said, well, I don't know if I really want that title, but, uh, you know, it, it's, it's important to put in the context so that when events do happen, like ever given in the Suez, ever forward off of Baltimore or a ship accident happens, I, I do like to provide the context of this is what the ship is doing, what it does. And more importantly, why it's important to you, you know, why is it important to the consumer in Iowa, New Jersey, in, 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 in Lithuania, in, in, you know, Nepal, and, and why is it important? And, and so I, I think it's a great opportunity to unmask that. Yeah, it, shipping is so important and it touches all of our lives. You know, pr most things that are in front of me, uh, including the computer, the microphone that, you know, I got uh, via Amazon and it you know, probably did come over on a ship. Does it ever strike you as odd that, you know, there are companies whose market value is, you know, over a hundred billion dollars. It's very high. And if they disappeared, like it's, it's not like life would be entirely different, but you know, probably the market cap of the entire global shipping industry is probably less than one of those single companies. And if there were no ships, I mean, it would be game over. It would be, things would be totally different. Yeah. It, it's, it, you know, it was, it was huge, you know, in 2017 when Hanjin Marine, for example, went away, you know, it, it was it was consumed by the other companies, so you didn't really notice it. It's a major. I mean, it was, it was one of the biggest companies in South Korea. Massive bankruptcy. Uh, really didn't resonate too much around the world in many ways. But today, you know, if 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 Maersk or MSC or one of these big companies would have an issue, uh, and 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 all of a sudden they disappear, today it would be massive. I mean, huge ramifications because we're we're pushing the supply chain to its limits. And, you know, we, we've seen it with, you know, cyber attacks on these companies sometimes. Uh, they're susceptible to it because they have huge networks that have to be open. And, and so, you know, when Maersk got hit by the Napietia virus in 2017, it cost them $300 million. They were out of service for three weeks. Uh, but again, there are other companies that can move in here. But, but, you know, again, these are companies that people see. They see, you know, these containers go down the road. Uh, they, they recognize them, but they don't know what they do. And I, yeah. I think that's really the key. You know, when the colonial pipeline goes down, you know, do we have enough tankers to move oil up and down the coast? You know, that's where OSG comes in. That's where Crowley comes in. That's where a lot of these companies come in that a lot of people don't know about. And, and so, again, to put some context to this, because, again, we have, you know, the, I always tell my students, you have the world at your fingertips. You have the greatest source of information available to you ever before in the Internet and your phone. The question is, where do you tell good information from bad information from? Because there's so much out there. And, you know, that's one of the things I try to do with my uh, uh, YouTube channel. Mm. Oh, yeah. So sorry. I know I've been saying final question for a million times. But <laughs> um, the what is because you said there's good information and bad information. What is the most frequent or most heinous instance of bad information that you see about shipping? Like, what's the biggest misconception? Well, I, I just think it's it's a misconception that it's not important, you know, that, that you know, ocean shipping, well, you know, my stuff comes from here and everything, you know. And and in truth, the, the oceans are essential. I had an argument the other day about somebody about uh, what was going on off China and Taiwan. And we were talking about the fact that, well, China can be blockaded, but its data can come out. Yet 99% of all the world's data is in these undersea cables. You know, and, and you know, I joke with students all the time, if you call someone from North Carolina and Australia, how much of that is actually in the air? 
And it's like almost none. It's from your phone to your cell phone tower. The rest is in cables by string under the ocean there. And wow. I think most people don't understand that ocean shipping is that same exact way with cargo and freight. Again, I go back to that issue, hit that Amazon button. I'm going to get next day shipping. It comes in a day. That cargo has been moving for four to six months prior to that. And that's a long logistics issue. And companies like Amazon, for example, were really innovative in overcoming obstacles. They leased ships. They brought ships into ports other than LA and Long Beach. They had ships that could offload themselves. So they didn't even have to go to a container terminal. They just had to come to a dock and they would bring a ship in with a thousand containers and offload them on a dock. They would have their own mini container yard there and truck them in. And they were carrying high value, low density cargo to get out of the backlog. And they're some of the greatest, you know, overcoming logistics problems in the world. And so much of our goods move by ship. I'll, I'll give a recommendation for two books. One is by an author by the name of Rose George, wrote a book called 90% of Everything, uh, which is you know her view of how things move. She wrote it in the early 2010s, wrote on a container ship uh, and really saw that. And then Bruce Jones's book, To Rule the Waves, which really talks about how dependent we are on the ocean to move goods around. And, you know, the, the post-World War II environment that allows ocean freight to move. You know, in 1950, we moved half a billion tons of cargo on the world's oceans. Last year, 2021, we probably moved 12 billion tons. And what you see wow. is an exponential growth in the volume of amount of goods we move on the world's oceans. It's ever increasing. You have dips usually with economic recessions, 2008, 2020, you know, all of a sudden you saw those dips happen, but it's ever increasing. And it's just because it is so cheap to move things. We've made the cost of manufacturing overseas. I, I did an entire video on a friend of mine who had a, a container of peaches and those peaches, she was eating them in Washington, DC. The peaches were grown in Argentina. They were packaged in Thailand. And I sat there and I said, think about that for a moment, that it was cheaper to sail peaches from Argentina on a boat halfway around the world to Thailand, package them, sail them on another boat halfway around the world, and then road or rail them to a store in Washington, D.C. than it is to grow the peaches in the United States. And that gives you an yeah. idea of why ocean shipping is, is so important for us. That, that is that is wild. Sal, thank you so much for being generous with your time uh, and insights. It's been an absolute pleasure. People can find you on Twitter at Mercagliano S. There is something that you need to be doing right now, and that is reading the BlockWorks daily newsletter. For top market insights and the latest in crypto news, you have to subscribe to the BlockWorks daily newsletter, and you can do so by clicking on the link in the description to this video or by visiting blockworks.co forward slash newsletter.